Good afternoon, everybody, and a very, very warm welcome um, to this talk today. Um, we're delighted that we've got Dr. Charles Shepherd from the ME Association with us today. Um, I'm very, very excited by this talk. We've actually waited well over a decade to have this conversation. This is the conversation where um, after years, many years of, of a lot of investment of energy and time by a lot of activists, by the ME Association, by a number of other organizations, we've actually persuaded NICE to not only review guideline, to come up with a new guideline, which was not an easy thing to do, and then the final battle was to get it published. So there's an awful lot of people here who have actually contributed to that process. And we're really, really grateful for your activism. And we're grateful for the support of, um, of the national charities um, who've made a significant contribution to that as well. So thank you. Um, I think people generally know the format of these talks. If you, if there is something that uh, Dr. Shepherd doesn't cover during his talk, please add questions in the chat or on the Facebook um, page. We will be constantly um, checking and uh, gathering those questions. I've got questions that people already sent in advance. Um, so bear in mind, we will have enough questions for about three days worth of constant discussion, um, but I'm gonna cut it short at 3.15 uh, because otherwise people tend to keel over. And so um, we will ask as many as we possibly, possibly can. Um, but we're very grateful for your questions, your interest, and there's no reason why those questions couldn't be passed on to Dr. Shepherd afterwards to inform future talks. So um, we're very, very pleased to have Dr. Shepherd with us today. Um, Dr. Shepherd is an old friend of the Sheffield ME and Fibromyalgia Group, and indeed can tell us a tiny bit about his links with our city as well. Um, um, Dr. Shepherd has, has done talks for us before um, in the city centre, which some of you may well have been to. Um, so Dr. Shepherd is the honorary advisor, uh, medical advisor to the <coughs> ME Association and played a significant role in um, the development of this new guideline. And what we really want to know is how to move this guideline from being a piece of paper that sits on a shelf to being something that is actually going to impact on the lives of everybody here today and the entire rest of the ME community, obviously in the UK, but actually we know it has worldwide significance. So can I put a very, very warm welcome to Dr. Charles Shepherd. There's gonna be a talk of about maybe up to half an hour, and then we're gonna sort of field, select some of your questions. Um, and I, I hope to select the ones that um, um, are gonna give us the most kind of fruitful responses or that, that Dr. Shepherd hasn't actually covered so far. So without further ado, please, a very, very warm welcome. If, you, if you've got, um, you, you can clap hands on this. <laughs> time. I don't know how to do that. Anyway, a very, very warm welcome to Dr. Shepherd. And uh, we look forward to hearing your pearls of wisdom. So, thank you. <laughs> Uh, right. Um, thanks, um, Carolyn, and thanks, Eliane, and thanks to Sheffield and Fibre, um, Sheffield ME and Fibromyalgia Group for organising this meeting and asking me to come along and talk about the new NICE guideline. Um, before I plunge into the NICE guideline, um, just just uh, two or three little background things. Um, first of all, my apologies in advance if there is noise in the background, because I'm speaking to you from the wilds of the Cotswolds, and outside, for some strange reason, um, we've got a burst water main and seven Trent are digging up the road and they were really noisy this morning. They've gone off for lunch and I hope once they come back from lunch, they're not going to be as noisy as they were this morning. So there may be some background noise. My apologies. Um, certainly for anyone who doesn't know me and quite a few people, I, I think, do know me in my background. Um, I, I'm a doc with 40 years, almost 40 years now, personal and professional um, involvement um, with ME. Um, like many people with this illness, I, I was a very fit young adult. I, I developed this when I was a junior hospital doctor. I was working in hospital. One of my patients had a very nasty dose of shingles. I developed chicken pox from the from the patient with shingles. Uh, chicken pox is one of these things you really ought to get when you're a child and not when you're an adult. And I, I went down with all the classic symptoms of ME. It took me two years to get a diagnosis. I eventually got a diagnosis from the wonderful Melvin Ramsey, um, who, who sort of named this disease and worked at the Royal Free on it. And I got to know Melvin very, very well. 
And it, it was further confirmed by someone uh, that also people may be familiar with, who's now sadly died, and that was Professor Peter Bean, who was a neurologist up in Glasgow at the time at the Southern General Hospital. And he was one of the few really influential doctors, neurologists, who, who believed that this was a neurological disease with immunological and virological components to it. And I got involved with, with various aspects of Peter Byrne's research over the years, in particular, um, the role of muscle pathology in this illness. Um, so I, I've experienced all, all the problems that most people get with both diagnosis and management of this illness and problems with doctors and benefit agencies and everything under the sun. I have many hats on, having been medical advisor to the Emmy Association for probably around about the past 20, 25 years, and I won't go into them all, but I, I as Caroline says, uh, most recently, the, the most important thing is, is working on this new uh, NICE guideline and being a member of the NICE guideline committee that produced it. Um, I, I will just mention my, my Yorkshire roots because I am a, 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 I'm a Leeds loiner. I was born in Leeds at Jimmy's um, and then my parents moved to Sheffield and we lived in Baynor Road, which some people may be familiar with, up in Holesborough, which I occasionally visit when I come back to Sheffield. We then moved to York and my parents finally ended up in a place called Pocklington, which is at the foot of the, the Yorkshire Wolds, a delightful little market town. Um, while my father was the pharmacist in Pocklington. And I, I was originally, because uh, I used to spend all my life, it was sort of real James Herriot country. And I originally wanted to be a vet and decided really at the last minute, I was not going to be a vet, I was going to be a doctor. And so went off to London and became a doctor. So um, the nice guideline. Um, as Caroline said, I, I'm going to talk for about 30 minutes. Um, I, I've prepared a handout, which I, I suspect many of you um, have um, received via email. It's, it's there on the ME Association website. It's there on the Sheffield website. Um, but that's going to really summarise what I'm going to say in the next 30 minutes. So all the key points are there. But if you want to scribble some notes and add some bits, um, then it's, it's there to make use of. Um, I, I'm also flagged up on the on the handout. You may be aware of it. I'll just flag it up here so people can hopefully see it. Um, I've produced for the MEA a sort of mini guide, a summary to the NICE guideline. It's, um, what have we got? It's about a 20, it's a 28 page document, um, as opposed to the full NICE guideline, which is 87 pages and contains quite a lot of stuff that people don't really want to know. So that's quite a nice useful summary of what is in the NICE guideline. You can download it free from the ME Association website. And it, it does actually look very nice in paper. We've done, we've printed it off in very nice, good quality paper. Um, and it's the sort of thing you could actually hand over to a GP. I've just suggested this morning someone does this, um, who says, who said, well, I wasn't aware there was a new NICE guideline. Oh, I'm not going to look at 87 pages on the internet. But um, it, it's something that you might consider handing over to a GP who, who wants to know a bit more about the NICE guideline. Um, so what I'm going to talk about <clears throat> in <clears throat> the next sort of 30 minutes and then take questions um, is just a little bit about NICE and NICE guidelines in general, how we developed this guideline, um, and then look at three key components of the guideline, which is basically the, the new recommendations relating to suspecting MECFS and diagnosing MECFS, and then what we've said in general about management, and then special issues really affecting children and uh, people with severe and very severe ME, where, where the guideline has gone into considerable detail. Um, and then finally, uh, which as Caroline said, is, is, is now probably the most important thing about this guideline, is getting it implemented. And <clears throat> I think it's important to realise that NICE guidelines apply not only to health professionals in both primary care in general practice and in hospital care, but they also um, apply to social care. And nice to use its full title is, is actually the National Institute for Health and Social Care Excellence. So these guidelines, and there is there's quite a lot about social care, and it's a, it's a very significant missing gap in the care of people with ME, um, these guidelines apply to what happens in social care as well. 
So let, let's kick off, and I'm, I'm going to go through this, the sections in my, my handout that I've got here that I've produced and, and pick out um, the sort of bullet points in that. So st starting off nice in general, what, what is this organisation? Um, it, it is supposed to be, well, it is an independent organisation. It's obviously financed by government. Um, I, I, I say it's an independent organisation because I think it, let's put it this way, it does take notice of what government says, it does take note of what the Department of Health um, says, but it, 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 it produces these guidelines in a very independent um, manner. And as, as it says on the tin, um, these are guidelines, they're guidance for doctors. Um, they're, they're not sort of instructions, firm instructions to doctors, although there are some things which you might regard as, as firm instructions, I think, in, in the case of some of the do nots. But, but they are guidance to health professionals who can still use their professional judgment. And this is, I, I think, particularly relevant um, in, in things that the NICE guideline does not actually recommend in the way of, say, let's say, drug treatments for certain symptoms. Because if the evidence wasn't there from clinical trials for, let's say, using something like a low dose of amitriptyline, tricyclic antidepressant to help with pain uh, or sleep disturbance, because the NICE guideline doesn't that specifically recommend that, it doesn't mean that the doctor can't prescribe a low dose of amitriptyline for pain. Um, on the other hand, where it says do not use, do not offer, and there are some very specific do not offers in this guideline, in particular Obviously, the main change from the previous guideline is do not offer graded exercise therapy. Um, do not offer lightning process is another one that we put in. And I, I think doctors would be in a very difficult position if they decided to, um, let's say, recommend graded exercise therapy or the lightning process to a patient with ME. And that patient then... Um, that resulted in not only no effective um, treatment, but it actually involved in, it, it made them worse, had some sort of harmful effect. Then having disregarded what a NICE guideline said and recommended something that the NICE guideline said do not use would put that doctor in a very difficult legal position. And I think they might well um, find themselves with a, with, a, with a negligence suit if someone came to harm as a result of, of not following a do not recommendation. So uh, th these are guidelines for, for health professionals. And the other thing is with, with the NICE process, the guidelines cover diagnosis and management. Um, NICE does not delve into the cause of a condition. So we did not spend three years looking at all the research papers, looking at muscle immunology, infection, neurology, and whatever, as to what might be causing ME. We did have some peripheral discussions on that. But what the, gui what the guideline committee does uh, in, in the case of any guideline is to look at the evidence that is there from um, published evidence from experts from patients on issues relating to diagnosis and management and it comes up with this if you looked at the guideline it, it's very bullet point orientated so it produces lots and lots of different different little topics and then produces bullet point recommendations and and points on all these different subjects now, NICE has become a vast organisation. It now has over 400 guidelines in publication. It takes three years to actually produce a new guideline. Um, and guidelines, of course, start to become out of date. So guidelines have got to be reviewed. Sometimes guidelines have got to be changed completely. So there's an awful lot of work going on. And this means that once NICE has produced a guideline on a topic, like it's done with MECFS, then that tends to be left there. It's on the shelf. NICE, the committee disbands. It's no longer active. It's no longer looking at problems that, that there may be in relation to um, the guideline. There is a certain amount of work goes on in the initial stages, and I'm involved with that at the moment on implementing the recommendations. But the, the prime, focus, prime focus of NICE is to produce this guideline and then it, it, it leaves it it leaves it to the commissioners and everyone else to get on and, and, and implement it um there is a movement now and maybe this will happen with with the mecfs guideline having learnt some painful lessons i think from the way this whole issue has been handled and we, we've now got of course conditions like long covid and covid so there is a move towards producing living guidelines because the process of, of producing a guideline has happened with the, with the original NICE guideline back in 2007 is that you have a guideline 
and it sits there for 10, 15 years unchanged. And uh, uh, this is clearly an unsatisfactory progress um, position in conditions where you're making progress with both research and treatment. So maybe maybe with the, with the MECFS guideline, we, we will have a, a, an extent of living guidelines as things hopefully progress with research uh, into the cause and treatment um, of the condition as is occurring with, with, with the NICE guideline on long COVID that's been produced. Um, now, I'm conscious that we have um, a, a lot of people from all over the UK, not just everyone from, from Sheffield in Yorkshire. Um, so I, I will just point out that, that in addition to NICE guidelines applying in England, they also apply in Wales and Northern Ireland and to some extent the Channel Islands. Um, Scotland um, has its own guidance called the SIGN um, system for producing nice type guidance on conditions. There is no sign guidance on MECFS, but there is something called the Scottish Good Practice Statement on MECFS, which I helped to produce in the very early days. And that is now really becoming rather outdated. It was, was published in, I think, 2010. And uh, at the moment, it looks as though NHS Scotland may be implementing making use of the NICE guideline as well, but we haven't got any firm information on that. Um, very briefly, going back to the first guideline that NICE produced, the 2007 guideline, which was, was really based on a largely psychosocial model of causation and, and produced a great deal of controversy. We always, at the MEA, regarded it as being unfit for purpose. It, it recommended very little else apart from graded exercise and CBT, and of course, these things were, were recommended as actual treatments for the underlying disease process, because the idea was that you had abnormal illness beliefs and behaviours. So CBT was recommended to deal with that. And then you become inactive and deconditioned. So graded exercise um, would sort that out. And of course, it didn't work. The, these were not effective treatments for the condition. And certainly in the case of graded exercise, they, they were harmful. And, and the opposition really from the patient community, as everyone knows, and the charity sector was, was tremendous and consistent. And, and we fought for many, many years to try and get these guidelines, this, this original 2000 and guideline um, um, reviewed and, 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 and changed completely. But there was great resistance from, from the powers that be at NICE that did that. And I, I must pay tribute really to two people here who, who got this process moving. One is the Countess of Mar, who's a longstanding supporter um, of people with ME, has now retired from the House of Lords. She's still our patron at the ME Association. Um, and a, a chap called Professor Mark Baker, um, who was a, a top um, person at NICE. And we had several meetings at the House of Lords with um, Councillor of Marr and Professor Mark Baker to discuss the 2007 guideline. And Mark Baker actually got it. He, he realised that this, this guideline was not fit for purpose and needed, and needed changing. So uh, they, th those were two people who were very instrumental in, in getting us a new guideline. And I think the, the, the final thing that changed NICE's view, and I don't think they'd ever had a petition um, that large... <laughs> And demanding a new guideline on the subject was that we organised a petition asking for a new NICE guideline. It got over 15,000 signatures. And so in 2018, NICE gave in and said, right, OK, we'll not only, we won't actually review the guideline, we will take notice of what people are saying and we will produce a totally new guideline. So the, the motion was, things were set in motion in 2018 to have a totally new guideline. And say so these things take, three years to produce. So the first thing is, is, is having scope meetings to decide what is going to go in the guideline, appointing a committee. And in this case, we, we had 16 health professionals. So we had a, a range of disciplines within that grouping. So there were physicians, people with, with, from, from diet, occupational health, physiotherapy, um, psychology. In, uh, interestingly enough, no psychiatrist um, on this committee, but we did have a psychologist. And then we had a group of physicians who, uh, to be fair to say, had a spectrum of views about causation and management of this, of this illness. Some, but not all, were from the, the specialist um, referral services that already exist. And then unusually for a NICE guideline, we had five patient representatives, one, one of whom was a, a, a carer for someone with um, ME. We also had a, a person with um, really quite severe 
ME on this group. Um, NICE guidelines normally, I think, only have three patient representatives, but NICE acknowledged this was a very um, almost unique guideline they were dealing with um, and a patient community that was very upset with the guideline that was there. So that, that was good of NICE and I, I, I must pay tribute to all the patient representatives because they, they really worked so hard um, on, 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 the, on the workload that was there. Um, we, we had a really good chair called uh, Dr. Peter Bowery, who's a consultant paediatrician from Leicester. Um, Peter had no previous uh, sort of experience or, 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 or really anything to do with MECFS. So he, he, was, he came in with a very neutral uh, position and I think chaired what, what at times were very difficult discussions and decision-making processes in, 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 a, in an excellent manner. And we were also lucky to have uh, Baroness Elora Finlay as deputy chair of the group. Uh, Elora is a consultant in palliative care um, down in Wales, but she's also a very powerful political figure in that she's a deputy speaker in the House of Lords. So it's a very interesting group of people to work with um, over a period of three years. So to produce the information in the new guideline and the recommendations in the new guideline, the, the committee had 30, we had I think about 30 meetings over a period of just over three years. And before the pandemic, these were face-to-face -face meetings in London. We would sit around in a large room um, for sometimes a, a whole day, um, going through our, our, our discussions. And then round the table would be all these people, these experts from NICE in different um, aspects of, of um, analysis of clinical research findings, economic findings, and everything else that we wanted to have further information advice on. So the committee spent a, a period of, as I say, around about three years reviewing all the evidence, and, and, and this amounts to thousands of pages of, of information that was prepared by NICE, all the information from the clinical trials that have been carried out into any form of treatment, um, whether it's drug treatment, um, non-drug treatment like CBT, graded exercise, um, any form of treatment trial that, that, that was, we considered was, was worth reviewing was reviewed. And we used a system called the GRADE system, which I won't go into. We had a, a series of medical experts who, who came along and gave presentations. We had people like Professor Jonathan Edwards, Dr. Nina Muirhead, um, Dr. Keith Geraghty, um, who came along and gave presentations in their own particular area of, of expertise. We had evidence from the charities, we had evidence from the stakeholders, we had patient evidence as well. So a whole pile of evidence that we, that we sat through um, and considered. And in particular, in relation to CBT and graded exercise, um, as people I'm sure are aware, the, the, the charity sector and most recently for the NICE guideline in, in, in particular, uh, have carried out their own surveys on safety and efficacy of CBT and graded exercise therapy. And Ford ME group um, of charities produced a, a, a very um, comprehensive um, set of um, information from um, quite, a, quite a big uh, number of people who responded to their survey on, on CBT and graded exercise. And that was carried out right at the very beginning of the, the NICE guideline committee. And that confirmed the findings of, of, of many, many previous surveys, which was that CBT wasn't an effective form of treatment and that uh, graded exercise therapy, probably more than half of people who went through that form of therapy and was actually making people worse. And that most people found pacing was the most acceptable form of activity management for this, for this um, condition. So all, this, all these different strands of evidence were discussed, taken into account. And of course, the, the members of the committee uh, then had, had their own personal experiences of either personally having this illness or dealing with patients um, with this illness. And over the course of time, we then formulated all these recommendations that are in the guideline on diagnosis and management. The, the, the bottom line from this very careful review of all the the research evidence, particularly the clinical trials looking at treatments was, uh, and, and this is extremely disappointing because I, I think if you tot it up, we're talking about millions of pounds over the past 20, 30 years have been spent on clinical trials, which 
to, to use the terminology of nice, uh, turned out in, 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 in the very thorough um, objective review of what was done in these clinical trials. These cl clinical trials were all low or very low quality. And that applied right across the board. It wasn't just for CBT grade exercise. It was for drug interventions as well. So at the end of the day, we, we, we had to come to this rather you know, disappointing conclusion um, that we do not have a safe and effective treatment for the underlying disease process in MECFS, whatever that is. However, there is still a great deal that we can do in the way of helping, supporting, and helping people to manage the symptoms sometimes with drug treatments, which can be effective. But we don't have a drug treatment at the moment that is an effective treatment for this, for this, for this illness. So at the, 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 the final bit to, to the development of this process is, is, is what then happened. And um, we, we finally produced uh, a draft which went out for public uh, went into the public domain um, in November 2020. You may remember uh, having a look at it. It was there for everyone to have a look at. And that was a sort of, it wasn't the final, final draft, but it was a sort of final version of what, what, we, what we wanted the new guideline um, to say. And there was an enormous amount of stakeholder response to this. And that, along with the pandemic, caused a further delay in getting this, this guideline published. But things did move along. Um, we, we obviously have to have further meetings to discuss um, what was, what was uh, in, in the stakeholder responses. The guideline was then fiddled with, various changes were, were, were made. Um, and there were a lot of difficult discussions um, during this period of time, but then we, we ended up with, with what was supposed to be the final guideline. And uh, then, you know, further, further spanners in the works uh, occurred. Um, although the entire committee in um, relation to the draft, the November 2020 draft, the entire committee um, approved that guideline, when we'd got to the point where the further stakeholder comments had been considered and the further version of the, 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 the guideline had been produced and we're getting now into sort of mid 2021, um, three members of the committee resigned. And in addition to this, I, I was actually asked to step down from the, from the guideline committee because I, I was finding myself with my other ME association hat on, um, trying to defend what was basically in the guideline, which was the removal of graded exercise therapy and the downgrading of cognitive, cognitive behavior therapy. And that was not something I was supposed to be doing while I was a, a member of the committee. So I, I had to stand down from the, the committee at that point. And as people may recall, we, we then had the position of the Royal Colleges, the Royal Colleges of Physicians, the Royal College of Psychiatrists, the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health, um, all weighing in and saying, we don't like these changes that are there. We can't support this guideline. And NICE found themselves, I don't think it's a unique position, but it's, it's, it's fairly unique. It's not something they normally find themselves in with a guideline. They had a guideline that they wanted to publish and they really did want to publish this guideline in the form that it was then. Um, but they had this, this really quite strong opposition from very powerful people within the medical establishment. So what was then decided was that, that we would have this roundtable meeting in October 2021, where everyone was brought together. It was chaired very admirably by, by a very distinguished physician called Dame Carol Black. And we spent the afternoon debating all these concerns from the Royal Colleges. Um, NICE went away. There were some tweaks made, some clarifications to the guideline, but no changes really in any, any substance in the recommendation. And NICE decided that they would then go ahead and publish the, the guideline, which they did in October. 2021. And I think it's fair to say that despite the continually um, opposition or disagreements from some of the Royal Colleges, um, it, it, it has been well received by the patient community. Um, it, 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 it is not a perfect guideline um, because it is a consensus guideline. It, it, it's, it's, it's recommendations that have, have been made from a group of people who don't always have to share the same views on things. And that's not easy to, 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 um, to, to, to bring together. 
But as I say, Pete, Peter Barry, I think that did this extremely well. We didn't, have, I don't think we had to vote on anything. So we, we, we all, you know, with, with things like this, we, we, we came to some compromises. Um, there are things in there that disappeared that I am disappointed with. There are areas where I think we should have said more, done more, but overall um, to try and get a consensus document that we could get through NICE, that NICE would want to approve, that even with the grudging um, disapproval of the Royal Colleges, we can get the services to approve as well. Um, I, I, I think we have achieved that. So uh, the final bit of what I want to say is, is really just try and cover some of the key points that are in them in the uh, guideline and then I think it's best to view this guideline as a clinical care recommendations for a clinical care pathway that takes account of what should be happening in both primary care that's general practice and secondary care that's that's hospital-based medicine and the process starts and this is new to this guideline and it's something that I I was very very keen that the guideline should should include and I'm glad to say that it, it, it does now, is that we, we don't just start at the diagnosis of MECFS, which used to be at six months of symptoms, which was a, a totally inappropriate thing to be doing for something like this. We start right at the very beginning, and here we've got you know, overlaps with long COVID. We start very, right at the very beginning when we've got someone in primary care in general practice who coming, is coming along, who's had a viral infection two, three, four weeks later, and is just not getting better and has got post-viral fatigue, ME-CFS-like symptoms. So there's this whole section in part of sections one, two, um, suspecting ME-CFS is one, two, and one, three, if you want to go and read it. There's this very clear, and I, it, it is very clear, and it's very good, um, what doctors in primary care, GPs, should be doing when they've got someone who is presenting with ME-CFS-like symptoms, especially after a, a, a viral infection, and how they should be suspecting um, that someone has got ME. And we, we decided, having looked at all the different diagnostic criteria that are out there, um, you know, Fukuda, Canadian, International, um, that we would base this on the Institute of Medicine criteria, which um, in actual fact lists five main symptoms of MECFS, which is debilitating fatigue, cognitive dysfunction, unrefreshing sleep, post-exertional malaise and orthostatic intolerance. So we, we would base this suspecting MECFS, suspecting that someone has this illness, on the some of someone having those symptoms. But the, we, we, we would not include, and this is where an area where I, I disagreed with our final recommendations, um, but we would only use four of those five IOM um, symptoms. So the, the key diagnostic symptoms for suspecting MECFS right at the very beginning are debilitating fatigue, cognitive dysfunction, brain fog, unrefreshing sleep, and post-exertional malaise. Orthostatic intolerance, POTS, problems with the autonomic nervous system are, 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 are optional in the NICE guideline. And then as has as, uh, as, as previously been done and is in most of the guidelines, um, uh, the diagnosis should be made on a combination of the symptoms, doing these baseline blood tests, which uh, are, are very familiar or should now be very familiar because they've been in the NICE guideline before, they're in all our guidelines um, and they're in many of the international guidelines. So a range of investigations to try and make sure that, that someone hasn't got kidney disease, thyroid disease, liver disease or whatever that might explain those symptoms. Um, and then a, a physical examination. And then most important of all management advice during those very early stages, which is, which is based on the fact that people should be um, uh, living within their energy envelope, um, very careful and cautious um, activity and energy management largely based on what we would call for pacing. So uh, what I would say would be very sensible advice for the very, very early stages. And then most important of all, in the, the final bit of this suspecting um, and diagnosing MECFS is the fact that, and, and, and this is a very specific recommendation, and this is very important in relation to implementation of these guidelines, that once someone has had symptoms, these symptoms for three months, they should then be referred on to a specialist team or referral service for the, to one confirm the diagnosis 
and uh, the development of a of a plan and a, 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 you know a written program of of care and management of that particular patient. And this means, and I'll come back to it when we just talk about implementation at the end. This, of course, means that where there is no existing MECFS service, and this is particularly applicable to many parts of Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, um, health service providers, clinical commissioning groups, etc., health boards, um, are, are really under a, and I think it's, it's almost a legal obligation now, to provide a service for people because they can't just no longer turn around and say, well, we haven't got a service for these people because NICE is making it very clear that there should be a service for these people. And there is a box, and this is in my um, handout here, and you can go to the NICE guideline. And it, it, the, the, there is a box there on what a specialist referral service or team should consist of. And it, it's some, there is some very important wording there, not only in relation to if someone is trying to set up a completely new service for people with MECFS, but also where there's an existing service and it's, it's really extremely flimsy in the range of health professionals that it, it has. So I, I'll just quote from it. And it says specialist teams should consist of a range of healthcare professionals with training and experience in assessing, diagnosing, treating, and managing MECFS. They, and th this is where I would disagree with the wording, nice put they commonly, but I say they should have medically trained clinicians, clinicians, mind you, from a variety of specialisms, including rheumatology, um, rehabilitation medicine, endocrinology, hormone disease, infectious disease, neurology, immunology, general practice, and pediatrics. No, no mention of psychiatry as well as access to other healthcare professionals who can specialize in MECFS. These may include physiotherapists, exercise physiologists, occupational therapists, dietitians, and clinical or counseling psychologists. So it is a pretty comprehensive um, specialist team that should be there for people who are going to get a hospital-based referral for this illness. Um, right, key points. On, on management from the guidelines. Um, seven in my, my handout is just some general principles of management. There are many, many different points that we make about general management and principles of management. I'll just pick out a, a, two or three of them, um, which I think are very important. And that is health professionals are now being asked to prepare and provide the patient and their GP with an agreed care and support plan of management. That's the specialist team that you get referred to um, uh, in, in, in hospital. There should be regular reviews in primary care. So people with ME should be reviewed by their GP. And it says quite specifically every year for adults and every six months for children. Um, there should be advice on cause and management of relapse and exacerbations, which is very important. And health professionals should ensure patients and carers have information on the illness, including support groups. When we go into more specific uh, aspects of management, um, if you go to the guideline, you will see that there is really a very detailed section on activity and energy management. And energy management. It, the advice there, I, I believe, is, is, is all perfectly sound. It's what the charities have been saying for, for years and years and years is what patients have been trying to get doctors to do. It, it is activity management based on convalescence, rest where appropriate, um, gradual, flexible increases in physical and mental activity, living within your energy envelope, all these very, very basics of, of what we would describe as pacing. Um, it then goes on, and it's, it's an area where I do have some disagreement with the with the guideline, um, it then goes on to talk about um, a final part of energy management is, is for people who want to increase what they are doing. Um, I, I have to say, I don't like the term activity programs or exercise programs because um, th there aren't any exercise or activity programs as such formal programs that have been reviewed or been subjected to clinical trials. And I think it's possibly open to misinterpretation. But uh, if you actually read the small print that accompanies it, what we're trying to say is that there are people who are improving um, with ME who want to increase what they do in relation to their activities and that there are things which people can be doing on the, uh, 
and, and actions which health professionals can be taking to help them to increase um, their activity levels and even do some forms of, of, of gentle um, exercise. Um, one area of the guideline that I find disappointing, but th this is not something that is unique to this guideline, unfortunately, it's, it, it's the way NICE operates, is that it, 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 I, I think we should have provided more uh, information and guidance on the management of individual symptoms. I, I think it is, it, is, it is too flimsy in that, in that respect. And this is partly or largely due to the fact that if you take a symptom like headache or pain or sleep disturbance or whatever, when you're producing a nice guideline, unless you've got specific evidence in relation to the management of pain in ME, which is, is not out there in the clinical um uh clinical trial evidence base um then what you do if you're producing a nice guideline is you refer off to another nice guideline on headache pain sleep disturbance or whatever and and why while the advice there can be very helpful and very relevant um it's not always specific enough to people with MECFS to make it really useful and i think that's where i think that's probably where this nice guideline falls down particularly in relation to what we did in the Chief Medical Officers Working Group report, um, which, which actually went into symptom management in, in a lot more helpful and detailed way. I mean, of course, the charities like the MEA produce detailed management on, on symptoms, but I, I think this is really something that NICE, NICE should have been doing. Um, CBT, as you were picked up, is still in there. It, it has been, I think the word is downgraded, so it's no longer recommended as a treatment. Um, for ME and it is something there that obviously and I don't have any problem with this um, can be used as a, a form of psychological support for people who are finding it very difficult to cope with an illness like this it, it may or may not be helpful to people but it's not a treatment for for ME and it's not something that should be you know forced on people or or, or you know highly recommended unless there's a unless it's been properly discussed with the patient. Um, as I've already mentioned, we, we've got do not, offers graded, do not offer graded exercise, do not offer the lightning process. We spent quite a lot of time looking at, at um, the evidence for the lightning process and uh, concluded uh, um, that it was this just not there to, um, um, to place in the guideline. Um, if you're familiar with the 2007 guideline, there were, there were actually quite a lot of things, uh, specific um, treatments like vitamins and uh, tests and whatever that were not recommended or do not offer um, and those have those have largely come out um, so uh, I can't remember them all, all off the top of my head but uh, it, it is it is less prescriptive in what doctors should not do I think antiviral treatments was, was, was one of the things although we're not recommending antiviral treatments in ME CFS it's, it's no longer saying you cannot prescribe an antiviral treatment you cannot prescribe or you should not prescribe an immunotherapy so the the, the, the clinician does now have some degree of clinical judgment if they want to go down that sort of route of, of uh, you know trying a rather more exper experimental treatment but providing that that is done with within their area of expertise and that it's done with what we call informed um, consent with the patients interestingly of um, melatonin we, I, I never could quite understand why melatonin um, crept into the 2007 guideline as a possible um, treatment for sleep disturbance but my own view is that, that melatonin um, can be very helpful sometimes for sleep disturbance but it's actually got a positive um, recommendation in the 2000 and guideline for um, children uh, providing it was okayed by by a paediatrician but it was rather odd because there wasn't really any sound clinical evidence to support that recommendation um, but melatonin no, is no longer mentioned um, in the guideline so it doesn't get a it doesn't get a positive recommendation, but it's it's not actually said do not prescribe melatonin. So again, it's it's up to a doctor's clinical judgment if they want to prescribe something like melatonin. Um, other just key points on on what we've we've put into management. There's a lot on children and safeguarding. Um, we, we're very fortunate in in having some real expertise, particularly um, a chap called Tony Crouch, who, who's a social worker who was on the. Um, guideline committee so I, I think we've made some, some strong recommendations hopefully which which are going to avoid inappropriate childcare proceedings and 
social workers rushing off and deciding that children have got factitious illnesses or Munchenhausen by proxy or whatever. Um, there is there is a lot more. In fact, I think the the, the 2007 guideline hardly mentioned, if I remember correctly, um, severe and very severe ME. Whereas this guideline um, does actually spend a, a considerable amount of space devoted to um, issues relating to um, care and management of people with um, severe and very severe ME, and and in particular mentions the need for domiciliary services, which are, are home based services. So services should be either going out to a patient's home where necessary um, and that there should be uh, suitable inpatient hospital facilities for people with severe or very severe ME who need to come into hospital for assessment and management. Um, so there's some very um, quite detailed um, uh, information there on, on hospital services, domiciliary services and the general management of people with severe ME and that includes um, some statements on aids and adaptions, um, which may be useful if you're trying to get a blue badge or something like that. Um, th there is uh, quite a lot of stuff there uh, in the guideline on social care and the fact that, that people should be able to get a social care referral. There is information on diet, nutrition, education and employment. Um, finally, uh, implementation of the new guideline, which is, is what we're really dealing with um, at the moment now. Um, as I, I said earlier, the role of NICE is to produce these guidelines and not see them implemented on a sort of day-to-day -day ongoing basis. They do have an implementation team. I'm, I'm currently working with, with some people on that, on an implement what's called an implementation statement, which will go out to health service providers and give them further guidance on what they should be doing in relation to implementing um, the guideline. But the, 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 there aren't people at NICE who sort of sit there in an office um, monitoring how a guideline on MECFS is being implemented um, day by day, month by month, year by year, um, once it's been produced. NICE, if necessary, will go back, as I understand it, if there are problems with implementation of a guideline, and consider what might be done to, to help to improve the process. But uh, th there are clearly some big challenges <laughs> Um, ahead here in getting this guideline implemented. Um, I, I think it'd be fair to say that the, 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 there are still grumblings from people within the Royal Colleges. I don't think the Royal Colleges are, are you know, happy, or at least the people who are not happy at the Royal Colleges, I don't think they're, they're, they're entirely happy with what is going on. Um, I've had uh, discussions with uh, a group which you may be familiar with called BACME, which is the professional association for um, health professionals who work in the referral services. Um, I, I have to say that these have been very constructive and, and helpful um, discussions. Um, one, one of the people um, who's uh, involved in this comes from, comes from Yorkshire, comes from, I think, from York. Uh, and I found her input extremely helpful. So I, I think as far as the professional grouping uh, is concerned that is involved with the, with the referral services, um, they are in support of the guideline, they want to see the guideline implemented and they want to work with charities, patients um, to get the guideline implemented. Um, there are people, however, and, and I know this from correspondence, which, which um, I'm involved with or seen at the moment and discussions with, with some um, of the existing services. Um, th th there is a spectrum going on at the moment from, from uh, take one service in particular that we're, we're involved with. Uh, I mean, this is an existing service that wants to reposition its current um, management program for people with MECFS. And we are working, I won't name it, but we are working with someone there who wants, I mean, we're actually on, got this on paper now, um, who wants to develop a clinical care pathway, which starts right at this business, in, in right at the situation in primary care, in general practice, where someone comes along with the, all these suspected MECFS symptoms, through to the referral to the hospital-based service, what that hospital reverse service there does, how it deals with children, how it deals with people with severe ME, what advice it gives on education, employment, benefits and everything else. So it wants to bring in 
all the current, all the new recommendations in the guideline into their existing service. And I mean, as far as I'm concerned, it, it's wonderful. It, it's an exemplar for, uh, you know, any other services. And, and we've actually recommended it to NICE as, as a possible exemplar um, for other services. But I say at the other end of the spectrum, and you may have seen this, it, it's, it's on our um, MEA website if you want to make use of it. Um, we decided at Forward ME Group of Charities um, that um, a chap there called Peter White, who is very adept at doing these things, would take on the job of um, dealing with websites from referral services who haven't updated their information since publication of the guideline. And, and if you look around the country, as, as, as we have to do, um, that there are still quite a lot of referral services that haven't changed their information and guidance on their websites at all. There are some that are still <coughs> mentioning graded exercise therapy and things that are not consistent with the new guideline. So if, if people um, are, are aware of websites for referral services that are not up to date, um, please let Peter White at Forward ME know. Um, he will then get into correspondence with the relevant clinical lead for that clinical service and see what we can do. Now, uh, having seen some of this correspondence that's going back and forth, it, it's, it's quite clear that there are services that want to cooperate. <clears throat> We've got one service at the moment that sent, a, sent us in actual fact the MEA, um, all their proposed new website information. It's not perfect, but it, it's, it's, you know, it's a real big move in the right direction. On the other hand, sorry, I'm gonna drink. On the other hand, um, we've, we've uh, had correspondence back from some of these miscreant, <laughs> miscreant um, services and websites um, where it is, is clear that someone in charge there is, is, you know, still in the sort of Royal College's camp of, of not really wanting to move <coughs> with what the NICE guideline is saying, particularly in relation to graded exercise. And uh, what the worry is that, that while graded exercise in particular may be removed, um, it may reappear in some of these services as something, um, the same sort of thing, but under another name. So uh, we, we, it, it, it's a real mixed bag at the moment. Uh, as I say, the, the, there are existing services who I think are doing very well, are very keen to implement the new guideline and, and are really trying hard to do it. And, and th th their challenge probably is, in many cases, is, is both financial resources, because they're going to have to um, do things they weren't doing before, um, but probably even more important because of the, the, the strains from the pandemic that's putting on the health service, actually finding new staff who can come along and fill these positions that need to be, need to be filled. Um, I mean, in particular, we, we, we very few services around the whole of the country for children and adolescents with MECFS. We're saying, just as with adults, that children and adolescents should then be referred at three months to a specialist service. And these services just do not exist at the moment. So that, 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 that is going to be a real challenge, finding one, uh, some of the money to, to set up um, or change, reposition existing services, and, and also create the staff, find the staff to, to do this. Um, the, the final bit, I suppose, about the implementation of the new guideline is the fact that, as I mentioned earlier, where there is no service that currently exists, one is going to have to be created. And that applies to many parts still of England, but in particular, um, uh, Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland, very few specialist referral services. And to actually create a new clinical service for people with ME is, is going to be quite a, a big job to do. Um, but again, it, it's something that, that clinical commissioning groups and what are taking over from clinical commissioning groups, which are called integrated care systems, are, are going to have to take on. And uh, again, we, we are working with some areas where this is happening. We're working in particular um, with people in the Isle of Man um, who have not only got uh, uh, some ring fence funding to do this, uh, I can't remember the exact figure, but I think it's around about 400,000 per annum. Um, and, and so this, this is now in motion to set up in the Isle of Man um, a, a proper 
MECFS referral service, and I think this is probably going to include people with long COVID as well. And that may be the case in one or two other areas around the country. There may be this integration um, with long COVID. Um, so th those, those are the challenges on implementation of the guideline. And I suppose um, in, in, in both areas where, where it's trying to get an existing service to reposition its service to take account of the new guideline or to set up a new service altogether, um, local groups and, and local people um, are, are going to have to play a, 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 you know, a, pre a pretty important role here because you are the people who know what's going on locally. You know whether what the service you're getting is good or bad. And really, if you haven't got a service at all, um, you know, I, I think it, it, it's you as local groups and local people who've got to get together and put pressure on clinical commissioning groups and integrated care systems, MPs, media, whatever, to either change what your current um, service provider is doing for people with ME or to set up a new service um, for people with ME. Um, right, so how are we doing on time? I suspect I've, oh, yes, I've slightly overrun. Um, not to worry. Um, right, okay, so I'm going to finish now. Um, I've spoken longer than I thought I was going to do. Um, there's finally three resources yeah. on my, quite, my hand now. <laughs> um, so there's a link to the NICE guideline. Um, there's our free booklet, which you can download from the website, or we can send out paper copies as, as, as well of that. And I will just flag up, um, there is something called a, a learning module, which is being produced by one of these companies that produces CPD, Continual Professional Development Learning Modules for Health program, uh, uh, Professionals called MIMS. And it, it, it's basically a guide to the new um, NICE guideline. So this is something that health professionals, your doctor can do. And if they, they, they complete the guide, the, um, the learning module, it's an e-learning module, it's, it's on, on, the, on the MIMS website there, um, they get a, a, what's called a brownie point for their general medical council annual reappraisal. So um, they need to get 50 points, they need to do 50 of these learning modules, so they get a point for doing it. So it's something you could flag up with your, your GP and he'll get a, a brownie point for his GMC appraisal. Right, okay. Uh, <laughs> I, I think, are we, are we Charles, the, um, three o'clock? Is it all right if I interrupt and start um, offering in some questions yes. that have yes. been- Yes, no, you, you, I think... I've talked long enough at the moment. You, Caroline, you, you, plot, you come in now, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, I'll try Thank and- Thank you very much. So just to say- <laughs> Yeah, we're, we'll try and get through them as quickly as possible. I think we're likely to go on till half past three, but we recognise that that-, that that may be tricky for some people. So, of course, leave whenever you can and you'll be able to catch the recorded version on YouTube when that's put up um, later on. I'm going to kind of, I mean, honestly, I am absolutely awash with questions. So I'm going to kind of group them so um, to see if I can sort of pull out some key themes. And I'm also going to, I think, focus on um, one of the things that's been mentioned by lots and lots of people is this thing about getting an annual review. I think Sharon in our chat kind of said, you know, basically that since we've had to fight for the review, fight for the guideline to happen, fight for it to be published, we're now going to have to fight for it to be implemented. This isn't going to be given to us on a plate. So how can people living with ME make the demand for the to be part of this annual review process? Um, and how can they be persuasive in doing that? What's your what's your initial advice? Because I think having an annual review is probably a very big, significant change. Yeah. It might not bring yeah. major benefits, but it's yeah. significant. You are noticed at least once yeah. a year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I mean, to start with, we, we obviously had long discussions about the, 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 these sort of recommendations, which um, you know, I, I think most people round the table at the committee would, would acknowledge were not going to be easy to put into practice. Um, but it, and, unless we, we actually recommended that these things were done, there was no chance that they were ever going to be done. So that, that, that there are recommendations like that, that which, to use this awful word, are going to be a challenge <laughs> to both doctors and to patients. I, I mean, first of all, um, one, one's got to be aware that doctors suffer from severe information overload and there's a limit to what they can know and read and everything else. And I think unless your doctor is particularly interested in 
MECFS, uh, you know, he won't have read the new NICE guideline. Um, and there's lots and lots of doctors around. As I mentioned, I was dealing with someone this morning whose doctor wasn't aware that there was a new NICE guideline <laughs> on ME. So there's lots and lots of GPs around who are not even aware that there's a new NICE guideline on MECFS. So uh, uh, the, the, the whole sort of issue of getting an annual review um, from your general practitioner, that is not going to come from the, unless you've got a very, a very unique general practitioner, that's not, that offer is not going to come in the post or email or whatever from your, your GP. You, you are going to have to raise it um, with your GP. Um, I mean, obviously, if you don't have a very good relationship with your GP or your GP normally sort of looks at the ceiling when you mention ME, um, it, 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 it may not be even worth the bother of pursuing. But I think if you've got a reasonable GP, um, especially one who, who's got any sort of interest in MECFS, uh, the, the way to go about it is, and I think you, you can't go and demand your, your review, um, but you can say, I, I, I think I, I, I don't come and see you very often about my, my ME, um, but I, I think, you know, as the new NICE guideline says, um, I would like to have a, a, a review. Um, you know, maybe you could say I'm, I'm over 50 now, um, you know, I, I think it might be time just to have my thyroid gland checked just to make sure that, that that's OK and that's not causing my what seems to be a sort of slight increase in fatigue. Um, so I, I think you could phrase perhaps you need to bring in something, some sort of handle as to why you, it would be a good idea to have a review. And I, I think the other thing you probably got to do is to produce some evidence why you should have a review. And as I said to the person this morning who raised this, um, I said that probably the best thing to do is, is because she's uh, one of our members, so she's got a paper copy of this um, um, uh, guide to the guide to the nice guideline. Um, it, it is to take that along to your to your GP and just diplomatically leave a copy there, um, and you could go to the page in this and say, you know, it does actually say that we we should have a. Uh, have an annual uh, an annual review um i mean at, at the end of the day if you approach the subject is there diplomatically any template for, for... sorry sorry is there any sort of template for what should happen in that review or how to produce a care plan is there is there anything no there's no the nice nice hasn't produced any templates as to what should if you're saying so, so i mean it's a very good point uh you, you know what should be in the review um I mean, there's there's no tent there's no template um i think I, I i'd have to i think go to the full guideline um i think we did expand on what actually should take place during during the review um but i'd have to go to the full guideline i haven't got that to to hand but i think it it, it should it, you know it, it, the basics should be how, how are you coping with symptoms uh i, I if, if appropriate, um, do you need a referral for social care or then disability aids or appliances or whatever? Are there any blood tests that, that might just need repeating? As I say, you know, if you're, you're mid 50s, 60s, um, you know, thyroid, thyroid disease comes on quite commonly in, in the over 50s, over 60s. It causes fatigue, it causes MECFS like symptoms. And sadly, um, you know, this just, just gets ascribed to, oh, my ME's getting a bit worse. <laughs> okay, so can I, so maybe what will gradually emerge is some kind of good practice examples and maybe we can actually be instrumental in spreading and sharing those. I, yeah, I, that, that is terribly important. And interestingly enough, in, 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 in the NICE guideline implementation statement, I, I think that will we'll have, uh, that, that, that does have some um, good examples of patient experiences. So, uh, you know, with, with, with this, with this guideline in particular, NICE have been very keen uh, to, to make use of the patient experience. Okay. And th there's quite a lot of people who've been asking about these multidisciplinary teams. Mm. Um, you kind of ran through the, the potential composition of yep. those teams. That there was a um, question from a um, person, Janet, about should sh if our team already has a psychiatrist linked to it, <laughs> should we be sort of trying to persuade the ME clinic to nudge that person out or um, <laughs> I, <laughs> Liz, Liz asked 
particularly about specialist nurses. Um, she's done a lot of work in Scotland with the Long Term Conditions Alliance, and specialist nurses were often very highly valued yes. members yes. of the team. So how how kind of tight is this composition of the team, and how do you see that developing? Because we're in a place where you know somebody's talked about. Um, sorry, I've got these names all over the place. Somebody's mm -hmm. talked about. Um, you know, being told by their doctor that elective surgery and cancer is now the priority and they are no longer the priority. Um, you know, the NHS is under huge pressures. How do you, how do people actually see this progressing? Mm. Well, I, I, I mean, I think, I think as the guidelines making pretty clear to certainly to commissioners, health, you know, health service commissioners who, who set up services, that this is now a priority to do. I mean, I think that that's, pretty clear and, and hopefully this further information that comes out from NICE on, on implementation um, will we'll make that clear. Um, uh, I, I'll just do specialist nurses um, um, uh, to start with. Um, I, I'm, I'm right with you there and that is a serious omission from the from the makeup of the specialist team box that is there. My wife is a specialist nurse or was a specialist nurse. So I'm, I'm right behind specialist nurses and where specialist nurses get involved in, you know, conditions like diabetes, inflammatory bowel disease, whatever, um, they can be really, 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 really good. Um, we, we should have put that in. I, 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 for the life of me, I don't know why it's not there. It should be, it should be there, should specialist nurses, because I want to see more specialist nurses. Um, coming it in, coming into this so I'm right behind you it's a serious omission from that in my opinion and it, and it should have gone in um, as, 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 as far as psychiatry is involved um, our, our position certainly as, as far as who should be leading these specialist services is, is, is that they should always be physician led that's that's the MEA's position it always has been um, the nice guideline guidance on, on composition of specialist teams um, doesn't actually go that far. Uh, it, was, it was certainly something I tried to put forward but, but didn't succeed in. Um, but having said that, as I say, it does make it very clear that the, the team should have, as to quote it, medically trained clinicians from a variety of specialties, including rheumatology, rehabilitation, endocrinology, infectious diseases, neurology, immunology, etc. So it, does, it doesn't list everyone that needs to be there. It doesn't actually exclude psychiatry. Um, and uh, th th there's nothing in the NICE guideline that does actually exclude psychiatry, um, as, it, you know, as, 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 as it would not, I think, in any chronic debilitating um, uh, condition. Um, I mean, the guideline to make it very clear right at the start uh, so we, did, we did try to emphasize this uh if i can just get the the right wording probably probably not um yeah so we say right, right at the very start um mecfs is a complex chronic medical condition affecting multiple body bodily bodily symptoms and as i say we we, we did not have a, a psychiatrist on the on the committee because we did not feel you know go down the route that this was a psychiatric disease um however as with any other long-term chronic disabling diseases some people can develop uh, emotional mental health issues so uh, I, my, my personal view is that, that, that there is nothing wrong in having a psychiatrist associated with a service for people who require that sort of help um my, my personal view is that um, psychiatrists are, are, are not an appropriate specialty to be acting as clinical leads for um, specialist referral services. And um, as, as, as happens currently, I, I do not believe that um, specialist referral services should be situated in psychiatric parts of a, of a hospital or mental health. Uh, parts of a hospital. Having, having said that, as I always have to do, I, I must emphasise I, I, I'm, I'm not in any way against psychiatry or mental health. Um, I, I've worked in hospital psychiatry. It's just as horrible and disabling as, as MECFS. Um, but I, I, I just feel that psychiatry has got a very limited role to play in the management of, of people with, with ME. And I think for people who don't have any um, psychiatric problems or mental health problems associated with ME, then it doesn't really have any role to play at all. 
Okay, thank you, thank you. We, um, we did have uh, one question from, I think it was Jenny, about wh what is cognitive dysfunction? What does it mean right, and how sorry. do GPs... Right. <laughs> so so uh, uh, co cognitive dysfunction is this awful bit of medical jargon um, which, which basically describes what, what you probably describe as brain fog. <laughs> So it's, 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 it's all these various problems um, relating to defective mental functioning. So it's, it's, it's problems with short-term memory and, and what we call working memory. So that's day-to-day you know, -day memory. Um, it, you know, an important distinction as far as the memory part of it is that it's not affecting what we call longer-term memory, memory from the past. Um, if you're forgetting what um, you know you, you did in childhood and, and things like, like this from the past, um, then that's rather more worrying and is not the sort of memory loss um, that, that, that occurs with, M, with ME. It's, it's much more short-term memory, what you went to the kitchen to get, this, this sort of thing. Um, it, it's, your, it, 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 it's your attention span, being able to concentrate on something for more than, a, you know, five or ten minutes, as we all know, people with ME, CFS find it increasingly difficult to concentrate on doing something um, as time goes on, and, and many people can't concentrate on something certainly hard for more than about 10, 15 minutes, and then maybe after half an hour it becomes very, very um, difficult. Um, it, it covers a range of different of, of different mental functioning problems. Another one is 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 word finding abilities. You can't find the suddenly can't find the right word, um, or you, you mix up words. It's, it's it's something called dysnomia. You you say the wrong word when you're doing that. So it, it's word for word finding abilities, um, information to you know being able to store and retrieve information, short term memory, concentration, attention spans. It's all it's that sort of complex of things and uh, i mean it is it is highly characteristic of me cfs i mean i i would very much want to query a diagnosis of me cfs in, if someone didn't have brain fog or cognitive dysfunction and of course it's it's got this big overlap with long covid because almost everyone with with long covid has brain fog and mm -hmm. uh, speaking to people with long covid it's 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 pretty much the same as, as brain fog, cognitive dysfunction in ME. Okay, um, I'm aware that some people are needing to leave and that's... Yeah, that's no, no, that's fine. I mean, yeah. Um, I'm just going to carry on for about another 10 minutes. Yeah, we'll... that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. Um, um, I think what you said about cognitive dysfunction and the understanding of it kind of leads on to questions from um, Shaz and Mark about just about the consistency right across the country. It just seems like the whole thing is a postcode lottery was, was Shaz's description um, mm. or Mark's asking about how you can get kind of consistent diagnosis um, mm. because, you know, what happens to you and how you're dealt with just mm. seems to vary even within a yeah. city. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I mean, it's exactly right. And then the, the, there's, of course, there's no simple solution because you've got, the, I mean, so if you take England, you've got this postcode lottery of, of I would say most of the country has got some sort of service, but there's a very significant part of the country um, that, that still hasn't got a local service. Um, and where you've got a local service, it, it, I mean, from feedback we get, it, it varies from really pretty good to, in some cases, really pretty bad. Um, so you've got a real mixture of, of what the services are currently providing. And I mean, one of the things that I, I've been talking to back me about and we want to continue this conversation um, especially in light of, of what's now in the new in the new uh, nice guideline is that I think there should be a consistency of policy amongst the uh, referral services as, as to what they are doing in relation to protocols for referral from general practice to who they will see um, what then happens at the, prior, at the, at the very initial assessment, um, what uh, services they're going to provide, dietitian, um, occupational therapy, physiotherapy, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, um, and how they're going to deal with activity management in particular. And I, I, I think this should be fairly, you know, there's got to be some room for, for individual variation, but I think 
the basics should be pretty standardized across the country. So it don't, you know, it doesn't matter whether you go to Leeds, to Liverpool, to Bristol, to Cardiff, uh, to Exeter or whatever, um, that you're going to get the same sort of advice on symptom management, energy management, the same sort of help with education benefits and whatever. Um, and I mean, that does not happen at the moment. <laughs> Um, and I think we, we really now have got an opportunity to do that. The, I mean, the best way that this is going to be driven forward, um, I, I keep going back to this organisation, back me, um, is I, I, I think the, the lead to a certain extent has to come from the professional organisation that's involved with the, um, with the referral. <laughs> And I think, you know, we, we've mentioned templates, I think a couple of occasions now. Um, I, I, I think you could you could have templates, exemplars, um, as, as I've said, I, I have suggested to NICE that the, uh, the clinical care pathway that has been developed or is being developed by this um, trust that we're working with at the moment. Uh, my feeling is that the, the way it is going, it could be an exemplar for, for many other services. Mm -hmm. And certainly it seems that the whole the whole model of patient participation around MECFS has set some very good high standards for, um, yes, for other yes. reasons. And well. uh, I mean, just quickly go back to that. The, so I say the service that we're working on this with this clinical care pathway, um, th their intention is to set up a meaningful patient involvement. I mean, they've already got patient involvement, but to set up a meaning, I don't know whether it'd be a steering group, something like that, um, but a meaningful patient involvement in what's going on. And of course, that's you know very different throughout the country and some some services have no real meaningful patient involvement from from local groups at all whereas others do okay um uh, i don't know can i can i ask you a question i mean what, what happens in sheffield <laughs> um in sheffield i think we've got we've got some gp practices who appear to have a lot of patients with um um, MECFS. The referrals to our local clinic are not evenly spread across the city. I don't know what that tells us quite. Um, we've got a local clinic um, which is led by um, an occupational therapist. I don't know whether she's here. Hello, Anne, if you are. Um, who we've been working recently collaboratively with um, in terms of trying to get out more information about all the groups and services that our charity offers. Um, and also with a view to try to seek funding for something which is a bit more like the specialist nurse service, but we haven't quite got there yet. Um, and that will be a joint project if we did also linked up with the university. Um, basically, the, the, the local clinic, which is still under the Health and Social Care Trust, which is in fact the Mental Health Trust, um, so probably not correctly located, um, it it offers a whole series of kind of group programs and short programs. So what people experience um, just through the service design is something that lots of people today have talked about in the chat, which is this revolving door. So if you manage to get your diagnosis from your GP and if you are referred to the ME clinic for, um, for that diagnosis to be confirmed and you might get onto a pacing program or similar, but basically after the six weeks, you're then discharged. And to most people that feels like abandonment. Um, so I, I think, you know, the clinic does a bit. It's, it's now taking referrals for people with fatigue related symptoms from long COVID. Um, so it's referrals have gone up dramatically, of course, of course, because mm -hmm. we told them two years ago and we all knew, didn't we? But the government didn't. And um, so, there is this just whole kind of revolving door issue, which is like you then go back to your GP who doesn't really have anything else to do, fobs you off a few times. And then if you're lucky, you might get a second referral to the same service to receive something you've already had. And, you know, your situation might be deteriorating um, or at worst you, you get dismissed or you get labeled with anxiety or, you know, I mean, other people might well add lots and lots of other stories about that. Um, but, you know, your whole kind of identity gets questioned, mm. really. Your ability to judge your own levels of health and illness get questioned. Mm. So it would be, um, yeah, the whole thing needs to change. As we know, yeah. there is something fundamentally stigmatized and discriminatory 
that is absolutely unacceptable for people living with these long-term conditions. Mm. Um, I could go on for another hour yep. as well, but I won't. <laughs> So um, one of the, I'm just going to come back to one of the, an interesting question from uh, um, Hannah, which is um, the, the guideline talks about, um, what does it talk about? It talks about um, self-monitoring and it links self-monitoring to the kind of energy levels that are going up and down or the rest of it. Mm. Um, and Hannah asks, um, given that the evidence base around self-monitoring is more linked to the CBT model, what, what actually actually is the purpose of self-monitoring? What would patients expect to get from it? What, you know, why is that a useful thing to do? Right, okay. I, I, I mean, I, I, think, I think this is one of these things which it, 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 it's going to help some people and it's not going to be helpful to others. And I, I think if I'm right, we didn't bring this in. Um, or did we? I can't remember now without, without looking at it. But I mean, just to take one perhaps practical uh, aspect of this, um, some people find it very helpful to uh, get a get a pulse measuring device, activator, or whatever to 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 measure their pulse or their number of steps that they've done during the day, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, some sort of a objective measurement of self monitoring activity, and they find that that helpful. Other people, and I, I will put myself in this category, don't find that sort of health self-monitoring um, particularly helpful at all, and don't and don't make use of it. So I, I, I think it's one of these things where it, it, it's it's not a it's not a rigid recommendation, or, or in my view, it's not a rigid recommendation. Um, if if you find self-monitoring of of symptoms, self-monitoring using various practical devices that you may want to make use of helpful um, then that's fine um, but otherwise I, I, I think it is a very much an individual um, thing I mean I mean the other the other thing you could do with self-monitoring of course is is that you can which, which people do and we've actually produced one it's, it's up on our website at the moment um, we, we produced a sort of self-monitoring as it were diary that you can keep um so just on a day-to-day -day basis uh, you could you could score your you know, overall function out of 10 or something if, if that's helpful to you fine i it, it mm -hmm. may be a very limited value i think when if you take that sort of stuff along to the doctor though i suspect it's not going to alter your your management so so i, I may not be giving a terribly helpful answer because i'm a bit ambivalent about self-monitoring interesting just on a very personal level we've we've had some <clears throat> success by keeping um you know using a fitbit and counting numbers of steps and you can clearly yeah. see some days it goes up some days it yeah. goes down and you can yeah. start to link some of that but um, yeah. um it's just that the gp likes things that are graphs and data rather than so yes yep. 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 So that had a little bit of extra kind of yes. power yeah yeah um, yeah there's um, on a completely different aspect that has been mentioned that there is um, something in, in the guideline about employment related, um, um, you know, assessment. And, yeah. the, um, you know, we, we, we do have met some members who are sufficiently kind of mild to moderate to manage at least a few hours work. Yeah. Is there anything in the guideline that's actually going to be really, really supportive? Because it seems, again, so much based on people's individual opportunity yeah. to be, you know, they may or may not be heard and yeah. they may be met yeah. with yeah. certain resistance. I, or... sa sadly, I, I would have liked to have seen a rather bigger section on employment in the uh, in the guideline. Um, sadly, the answer, I, I think, basically is, is not, because I, I, if my memory is correct, I have to look at it, I think we've probably got about three or four bullet points on on employment. I mean, it, 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 it's it's pretty general stuff about, you know, providing support for people who want to um, return to work with modified duties or hours or whatever. It, it, it's, it's the fairly standard stuff saying saying to a doctor or health professional that that support should be um, should be there. Um, I know that we put in a, something about Emmy being um, covered by the um, 2010 um, Equality Act, which of course it is. Um, but uh, as, as far as much more detailed 
guidance on employment. I mean, actually, on the ME website, we, we're just in the process of updating it. The updated version is nearly, nearly ready. Um, there is quite a comprehensive, uh, about ten-page booklet um, covering all issues relating to to employment, and and the, the sort of legal side of it has been written by our employment solicitor. Um, so that's you know duties of an employer. Uh, who's in, employing someone with um, MECFS, even uh, issues relating to whether you can sack them for, for being off sick. Um, but in particular, the sort of modifications which under the 2010 Equality Act you should be able to um, ask for. Um, th there's a lot of employment related stuff. Um, as I say, it, it, it is very briefly mentioned in, in the guideline. It, in my opinion, it, it should have been rather more comprehensive. Um, I so say we, we've got a very comprehensive booklet on on employment, and we do have a, a, an employment solicitor who's who's willing to give um, half an hour's pro bono free advice um, to people who are in employment disputes. Okay, I'm going to squeeze one last question in, which is um, concerns raised that somehow people's diagnosis of MECFS is going to start drifting. To being something different so trauma fatigue was one thing mentioned um fnd is another thing that gets mentioned a lot um are you know do you think there's a danger that that people are going to start sort of using different labels because they want to get out of the work involved in this mm -hmm. guideline mm -hmm. well i mean cl clearly there are still some physicians who don't i mean the, uh, to start off with that, that, I don't think there's anything in the guideline which suggests that, that other labels should be used for this okay. condition, uh, in, in particular functional neurological, FND, functional neurological disorders, which is, which is one in particular. Um, but uh, physicians and people in different specialties who either don't like the name MECFS or think it's something else or think it's part of their um portfolio but again don't like the name so they've come up with another name for it um that that is going to continue in medicine you can't stop it let's put it that way um fnd is 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 quite a significant problem at the moment in some parts of the country um where there are certainly i mean if you get referred to new, to a neurologist in some parts of the country um you, you won't get a diagnosis of mecfs you'll get a diagnosis of functional neurological disorder which, which basically means that, that the neurologist accepts that you've got neurological symptoms but you haven't got what the neurologist would call neurological disease <laughs> So you have what 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 they then describe as a functional neurological disorder. Um, that's been it. That's in a way, it's, it's almost it's 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 a sort of medical jargon, polite way of saying you've got neurological symptoms, but they're largely psychological. Yeah. I don't I don't like it, but um, it's a local, a local issue. This the, I mean, we won't go into it in detail, but I mean the, this stems from the fact that basically neurologists um, they're, they're almost a breed apart in medicine. Um, and they don't like they, they, they don't like MECFS. Uh, most of them don't like CFM dealing with patients with MECFS. They're not very good at dealing with things they can't explain like this, and they're not very good at, at, at when 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 it comes to trying to accept that because you haven't got physical signs of a neurological disease that you you, you know that you actually do have some sort of neurological component to it. It's 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 a real it's a real straight uphill struggle with neurology. Yeah, indeed. Okay, um, so we're we're just gone half past three. So I think I'm going to wind up today's session. Um, just a couple of brief comments. If you go on the website of the Sheffield ME and Fibromyalgia Group, you will find, um, obviously later on tomorrow, whatever, um, there should be a recording of this talk. But they will also there are also recordings of other talks. We've had things on POTS, um, on um, diet, um, and a whole range of things. So please go and have a look. Um, yeah, thank you to our Welsh friend. Um, and we, um, in the Sheffield group, uh, we have two benefits advisors, and we run a whole series of different sorts of group activities. Um, pretty much entirely online at the moment, but we'll do more in-person things in the summer. So if you're not already a member of the Sheffield Group, and if you live in the South Yorkshire, North Derbyshire area, please um, get in touch and join. 
And um, the other thing that we've started recently is we've started um, an online choir, and that's for anybody across the UK. So if you're at all interested in singing, don't worry, your microphone will be off. So you won't even be heard, but you will have a lovely, gentle time. Um, so the next one is next Thursday at 11 a.m. But again, look on our website and, um, and join a UK-wide ME choir, which is, I have to say, totally delightful and very, very moving. Um, so I'm going to say a massive thank you to Dr. Shepherd for sharing his time and his thoughts with us today. I think there's a sense in which um, huge progress has been made by getting a guideline, getting it published, which was ridiculous. And, um, and then there is a huge amount of work to do to take this forward. If there are people particularly local to us who would like to be part of, of that campaign to get the NICE guidelines implemented as best as we can make it happen in our local area, please um, yeah, just send a, an email to info at and we will convene a meeting and actually look to take this forward. And we'll stay in touch with the ME Association as we always do. Um, and we wanna share best practice and we're in touch with loads of local groups like this all around the country, some of which I think are represented here today. So big thank you to Eliane and Simon from the Sheffield Group for supporting me today with all the behind the scenes tech. And, um, and a big, big, big thank you to all of you for coming today and for staying the course. And um, yeah, it's, it's been great. I feel like we could talk for about another week. <laughs> um, and I'm not quite sure what to do with all the questions that haven't got detailed answers. Um, for anybody who asked about children, I would recommend getting in touch with Nigel Spate um, who, who, Dr. Nigel Spate, who also contributed to the guideline and who's the expert paediatrician. Um, so, yeah, big, big thank you to absolutely everybody. And thank you, especially to Dr. Charles Shepherd. So, very much. Thank you. <laughs>